Okay, thank you for coming this evening to the online meeting for AGB 165. We'll be talking about the pork industry tonight and we'll be looking at pork production, pork processing and the wholesaling, uh, retailing side of the pork industry as well. We'll also go through, we'll touch on assessment item number one and we'll look at some value chain um, diagrams as well. So uh, last night I uploaded a um, macro pork industry uh, PowerPoint presentation with an MP3 uh, presentation that was done by uh, Nathan Michael. So once you've, um, if you haven't already looked at that, I would suggest you look at that after we've had this online meeting because that will just um, give you a little more uh, information in relation to the pork industry from a macro, at a macro scale. Okay, so what do you know about pigs? Okay, what we're going to um, what we're going to do today is look at two different types of uh, piggeries. We're going to look at intensive and also a free range piggery. You'll notice there is a YouTube uh, a link to a YouTube clip. We won't have a look at those uh, now, but I do urge you to go in and have a look at them. They're really good. They're really informative, and they actually um, cover. Um, what we're actually looking at today from a production perspective, but you can actually visualise it all as well. So there's definitely value in taking the time out to look at this YouTube clip on um, Bangalore, and also there's another one on a free range uh, piggery as well. So what we'll be looking at is the pig life cycle to weaning. Um, the after weaning, they're generally they're both grown out in sheds, although um, the sheds are a little different which you can see that in the YouTube clips. Um, the free range ones tend to be lined with uh, rice husks and we'll see a photograph of that later. Uh, the intensive ones tend to have grates, but there's, they all serve the same purpose in the sense that they're managing mating, feeding, um, temperatures, and but it's just done in different ways. Okay, so we're going to just start by looking at um, going through this photo essay of the Australian um, pig value chain and we're going to start with production and we'll look at breeding in particular. Okay, so you can see there you've got a, a boar, uh, pheromones frothing in his mouth to produce, uh, froth produced in the boar's mouth to stimulate the sow uh, to display estrus. So you can see there the boar is on the right hand side and they've, they're generally very close together and uh, you've got the technician there is AIing the sows. So um, in intensive and also in free range piggeries they tend to use both systems AI and natural methods. So um, one is to also ensure that the bloodlines are far enough apart not to cause any issues as well. As well. That's when you're utilising your AI. Let's take a look at furrowing in the production system for piggeries. So in a um, in a intensive system we have what they call a furrowing crate and um, this the idea of a furrowing crate is actually to protect, protect the piglet. Um, it can take up to 20 minutes per pig during birth and some litters can be up to 10 or more piglets. So it's quite some time that the sow is actually um, giving birth. So these um, farrow crates are used so the sow doesn't actually walk on top of them if she gets agitated. The free range um, piggeries have a, a different method. They, there's another typical farrowing crate that's warm and dry. They have um, the free range uh, piggeries have outdoor um, farrowing huts and the sows walk in and out while the piglets remain in the birthing hut. So those particular structures you can see in this photograph are actually the, um, the farrowing huts on a free range piggery. And you'll see that um, the sows, after, after they've finished furrowing, the sows and the piglets are um, out walking around. Um, look, it depends on what suits each person. This may be a little bit more um, of a risk in relation to the piglets potentially being squashed by the sows as well. But um, it, you know, each individual grower is different. Okay, now we're going to talk about weaning. You can see here in this photograph 
that um, these are weaners in an intensive um, production system. So they've got straw straw beds for their um, on the floor. They're um, huddled in a warm, dry. Okay, Luke, Dad had a mixed system with free range dry sales and shedded for farrowing. Okay, so any shedded, I assume, Luke, to prevent piglet piglets being squashed. Oh, and eaten. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And how long did they keep them in the farrowing shed before they would, he would move them out? Okay. Yep. So they were fair size by the time um, they were moved out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Okay, Luke, it sounds like you've um, got a lot of experience in the industry, so um, any comments you'd like to make, greatly welcome to. That's fantastic. It's good to have um, someone else that's that understands the industry as well. So here we've got wieners with uh, fresh food and water. They're dry and they're able to huddle together for warmth as well, and they've got a nice sort of straw bed to lay on. So this is a typical example of, a, of, a, um, of an intensive system. Okay, so in the free range system, the weaners generally um, generally live in eco shelters, like you can see here in this photograph. There's usually rice hulls for bedding, and they open ended, so um, they get some air circulation through the um, through the the eco shelter, and they're not not enclosed like the intensive systems as well. Uh, when it comes to weaning, the intensive systems are temperature controlled as well. Did you guys have any temperature controlled system, Luke, with your piggery? So here's a typical photo of a um, intensive piggery with the temperature controlled grower sheds. So they'll try and maintain an um, ambient temperature throughout uh, throughout the day. Okay, yeah, Northern Queensland, so the heat is going to be a problem. And these guys, we talk about um, heat and pigs a little bit further down the track, so um, you can make comment on that too. So temperature control is quite important in a piggery. Um, okay, so what do we know about pigs? Uh, pigs are uh, monogastric, they're not too stomach like um, sheep and um, cattle. They're omnivores, so they'll eat most things. And their physiology is very similar to humans. So um, you may or may not have heard of heart, pig heart valves being used. Um, various studies on um, such as insulin, stud, insulin studies, and there's been Parkinson, Parkinson's disease research studies using pig parts as well. So um, I don't know if any of you guys watch CSI or anything like that. They us usually use a pig as replacement for a human when they do any of the experiments. So um, physiologically, they are very similar to humans. So here's just a diagram of your of your monogastric as well. So you can see they've got a, a single stomach. So as a result, they have um, specific nutrient requirements. So they can't live on grass alone. They don't have the digestive system to be able to cope with that. They can, um, an adult dry sow can utilize up to 50% of good pasture, but young piglets will um, only 5 to 10% before their growth is affected and they um, stop thriving. So um, they also need uh, continual access to grain, but they also need access to amino acids essential for uh, good growth. And the grain that they have access to needs to be uh, processed, otherwise it will get, go straight through them. And generally um, pellets, the grain is usually milled and mixed with amino acids and um, through a commercial feed mill. The majority of the um, piglet feed, and Luke, I don't know if this is the case with you guys, if you had your own mill on your farm or if you purchased um, pellets in um, as pig feed. 
and it's also imperative they had good quality cool water as well. So oh okay so you had your own mill and you made mash. Now did you make different mash depending on the type of pig you were feeding? Okay, while Luke's answering that, I'll keep talking. So, um, yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah, so they have different requirements depending on the stages of their life and what you're trying to, to grow them out to and the specifications you're trying to grow them out to as well. So when we talk about pig production, we've gone through, um, uh, basically we've gone through the um, artificial insemination or natural um, uh, natural copulation and then we talk about um, farrowing, weaning and um, we talk about the the actual um, monogastric system of a pig and now we're going to go through around the selling process of um, pigs as well. Luke, how did you guys sell your your pigs? I'll keep talking while you're answering that. So um, most of the pigs are sold um, direct to the seller from farm to abattoir. There's sale yards in Camden. There's also, yeah, exactly. So there's also sale yards in Forbes. Um, you can see there the Camden um, sale yards sales are quite small and as are the Forbes one, comparatively speaking to your large selling centres in say um, Wagga for sheep and Roma for cattle. So it is a much smaller industry in that uh, respect. Okay, so there's a few options in relation to um, selling selling pigs. You can have direct consignment. Um, the advantages to that are that um, you have lower market costs. You can negotiate premiums on weight and grade depending on what the um, the actual purchaser is after. The pr prices are fixed and stable, so you will actually know what your costs are on a weekly basis in relation to. Um, to maintaining your, your piggery. So if you know that you're going to have a certain amount of outgoing and a certain amount of income, then you can actually manage your profitability quite easily as well. Uh, payment is based on objective measures, so um, it's usually on those negotiated weight and grade. You can often get feedback. Did you guys get feedback, Luke, from, your, um, from the Meatworks at all? Um, I'll keep talking while you answer that, Luke. Um, you can get individual contracts and um, there tends to be less handling of the animals so you have uh, reduced meat quality issues as well. So the main disadvantage is if there are price fluctuations in the marketplace, then, um, okay, Luke, um, if there are price fluctuations, then you can't actually capitalise on those um, price fluctuations because you've actually got a, um, a contract already with your with your purchaser. Uh, there may be um, some counterparty risk if you have an issue with your um, with the um, person that you've entered into a contract with, and um, they take a consignment but can't pay for it. And there may be at times it may at times that you can't, there may be times when you can't actually mean, maintain the specifications so you may actually get docked for not being able to meet those specifications as well. Another alternative is by use, is using sale yard auctions. Uh, the advantage of sale yard auctions is that um, that you can move problem stock so you may have stock that um, is out of specification so you will be able to get rid of it quite easily. There is an element of competition in your sale yard auctions so you might have a really hot auction um, one particular week and make more than what you had anticipated and payment is on an as-is basis so you're not actually, um, it's not fit for um, purpose in the sense that you don't have specifications that you have to actually adhere to as well. Uh, the disadvantages are that the pricing is subjective uh, so it may also disadvantage your premium stock that you have with you. So you may not, you may get not a bad average price across the um, all of your pigs, but your premium stock may not get what they may have if you did a direct consignment um, contract. You do have sale yard costs due to commissions and charges, generally around five to seven percent. 
um, there is a bit of extra stress on the animals, so that may have an impact on the meat quality. And you are also prone to price fluctuations as well. So fairly typical sale yard auction issues across a variety of different uh, livestock enterprises. Um, pigs aren't any different in that respect. Okay, so there's a number of export and domestic uh, abattoirs throughout New South Wales. You've got uh, one at uh, Bouillon Casino plant near Lismore and the Riverlea down on the border at Coral, which is one of the largest vertically integrated pork businesses in Australia. Then you have a number of domesticated, uh, domestic sorry, abattoirs in uh, Coonabarabran, Fredericton, um, Wollandindi, Wilberforce, Cowra and Maruya. So um, in relation to transport to um, abattoirs, the main um, issues that tend to come up are um, animal welfare issues if they're travelling long distances because that isn't an, very many abattoirs to, to service all of New South Wales. So um, Pork Australia are fairly um, committed to um, working with with uh, producers in relation to um, or working with the industry in relation to welfare issues as well. Okay, so we're going to start talking about feed inputs. Um, now, feed input is the actual major component of pig producers' total costs um, because the grain has to be milled, so depending on what grain you've got access to, whether it be wheat, barley, sorghum or oats, and depending on the price of the, the grain at that time. And you also add protein meals, so you've got meat meal, canola meal, soybean meal, again, depending on the um, price of that commodity at the time as well. And then you actually have the labour input um, at the mill as well. So actually producing pig um, pig feed or pig pellets is quite expensive in this in this country and um, this probably does explain to some degree why uh, Australian pork producers struggle to be competitive against imports from other countries with lower labour and feed costs. So in an average season they say feed costs are around 55 to 60 percent of your overall production costs. Um, in, the prices obviously increase during drought periods when um, access to grain is limited and it can be anything up to 70% um, of the cost of the actual feed. And also 70% of pig feed is in New South Wales is supplied by commercial feed millers. So if you have a look at the split of your piggery expenses, you can see that the vast majority is your feed costs and then um, second largest piece of that pie is actually your labour costs. So there's two fairly um, fairly set costs that aren't going to potentially reduce any time soon. Okay, so this, um, this graph actually takes a look at the impact of um, drought and increase in your grain prices. If you can see the green line um, gives us price per tonne of um, of grain and you can see during the um, the drought that it's actually peaked at around about $375 uh, per tonne and so obviously the cost of the pork, um, the cost of the animal increases so the industry then comes under threat of, um, of increased imports. Um, so increased imports from overseas do then um, drive the prices down. So costs go up and prices go down as well. Okay, so we're going to talk about the, a bit more about the physiology of uh, pigs. So pigs don't sweat and they need shade and they, they need to wallow outdoor and um, if they're outdoors, sorry. Indoors, as you said, Luke, um, you guys had fans in your sheds. Um, some pig producers also use drippers or misters as well. Um, hot climates can impact the productivity of, um, of pigs as well. You had sprinklers? Okay, yeah. And could you tell by um, the pig's body language if they were hot and struggling, do you recall? Because that's one comment that's been made is that um, 
you can basically tell if they're if they're struggling with the heat. So pigs have a thermoneutral zone, which is um, it is a zone between their upper critical and their lower critical temperatures. It's a region in between, and it's important to maintain the pig within this equitable range for them to um, for them to actually keep producing. Yeah, right, Luke. So they did get excited when the when the water came on. So they do actually um, feel the heat. And if you have a look here, a sow's thermoneutral zone is between 16 and 22. While a piglet, they're obviously a lot more, um, a smaller animal. So a piglet's is 30 to 35 and they decrease as they age. So weaners are um, 24 to, um, to 30 degrees. So as the animal ages, they have a much lower um, tolerance of, of heat. And as it says here, the body language tells you how they're feeling and obviously they get very excited when the fans are turned on. And as we know, heat stress can kill and result in abortions in pregnant sows. And it, you know, they do, their thermoneutral zone is much lower than um, the new piglets as well. So um, this photograph is of, um, of a free range piggery and um, we're looking at the, the wallows that uh, pigs lay in. This helps them to actually maintain their, their temperature. Uh, they also get sunburnt, which is why they generally cover themselves in mud as well. But um, these wallows need to be managed. And if they're unmanaged, that they, they can become a threat to um, the infrastructure and also the environment from an effluent um, and erosion perspective. So um, a well-run free-range pork farm will actually maintain these wallows to ensure that they're not compromising any of the infrastructure or their, um, the environment that in which the animals are, are living as well. Okay, when we talk about housing, there's um, between your intensive and free-range, there are um, different types of housing. So um, in the um, sorry, it's Pork Australia at the moment are um, making an industry move to go sow stall free. Uh, at the moment it's voluntary, and um, but the industry has indicated um, very strongly that that's the way that they will actually move. Uh, Coles, I'm pretty sure, um, will only purchase... Hi Beck, how are you going? Um, will only purchase uh, pork products that are from sow stall free piggeries. So they've taken a bit of a stand on that. I had a question asked last night about whether the... Um, oh, that's no drama at all, Beck. Um, I had a question. So we're just talking about um, pork production at the um, sort of at the piggery scale. And um, we're just talking about housing at the moment. So we've, um, you'll be able to have a listen to the first part of this, of this meeting. Um, yeah, so there's varying different types of housing, concrete floors with slats, metal grating on the older sheds um, and also um, as it says here they're moving to store free or grouped houses. When you have a look at, this is a typical eco shelter that you'll find in um, free range that we've spoken about earlier. Yeah, big cost imposition with lost baby, yeah, true Luke. Um, but and the, the producer will wear that cost, um, but obviously there's a pull from the consumers and um, Pork Australia actually, they're basically, um, you know, listening to what the consumers and, and moving from an industry perspective accordingly. So when we look at um, eco shelters, uh, you can see they're sitting on their rice holes, again, um, open-ended, so lots of airflow. The issues, they do have their limitations, eco shelters. Um, you do need to have really good drainage, so your soil type, you need to have quite a specific free draining soil type as well. Okay, housing and husbandry. Um, so typical in an intensive piggery is uh, dry sow sheds. They include breeding areas and areas for the boars as well. A farrowing shed, which we looked at earlier, which is where the, um, the sow gives birth to the piglets. And then um, you have a wiener shed, which if you look at those, um, the, the YouTube, the first YouTube clip, it goes through the process of farrowing sheds, wiener sheds and growing sheds. 
and um, the weaner sheds are for um, to wean the piglets off their mothers and then you have grower or finishing sheds depending on um, your specifications or how you sell your um, animals you might have different sheds for different specifications and um, in relation to housing and husbandry uh, they say in all out best in terms of disease control and cleaning so at any given time all the animals are in and they're all out and the first YouTube clip goes through hygiene and how they manage hygiene because biosecurity is a massive issue and they're very tight in piggeries around um, biosecurity because they can pick up uh, bugs quite easily and, be, and it will go straight through an intensive piggery quite quickly which can be quite devastating um, for any business. Um, so in that sense an intensive um, an intensive system is much easier to control disease. It's much harder in a, um, a free range system to control disease. Okay, so we've just come to the end of the production um, system and we'll talk about, um, oh sorry, also there's separate diet formulations for your various types of um, pigs as well, as we've mentioned earlier. And there's your farrowing crate. Okay, so what we're going to talk about now really quickly is processing and um, manufacturing. How do we get it from a free range pig or um, a pig that's intensively farmed to bacon that you pop in your uh, pan on a Sunday morning? Okay, so this picture is Rivoli. Um, uh, it's the largest fully in integrated pork production, processing and wholesaling distribution company in Australia. And you can see there's um, the carcasses are on the hook there. Now I'm not going to go through these uh, these steps with you individually. I would um, take a look at this. This um, presentation is up on your um, on your Interact site. Uh, so, but it just steps through the various um, the various steps from stunning right through to um, invisceration of the animal as well. Okay, trimming, washing, grading, weighing, chilling as well. So the various steps in the processing uh, processing of the animal. So this is, um, this what we're looking at is the value chain of the pork um, in the pork industry here. So we've looked at the production side of it. We're now looking at the processing side of it. And from a producer perspective, there can be a number of um, a number of things that actually um, affect affect the um, affect the quality of the meat. There might you might have things such as genetics, sex, diet, on farm, and transport and handling. We mentioned um, sort of transport and handling in relation to what type of selling that you're doing, whether you're selling through sale yards or not. You can tend to have a lot more issues with your um, with your meat quality as a result of uh, transport and handling through the, the meat auctioning system. So, um, and the impact on the meat quality is given a star rating as well. So the higher the star, the greater, greater the impact as well. So that's from a producer perspective. This next slide shows um, effects or on the quality from a um, processor perspective. So you've got your pre-slaughter handling. If they're highly stressed, um, that can cause issues in relation to um, in relation to meat quality. How you handle the carcass, uh, the product preparation and aging, and also the moisture infusion as well. So you can see that that um, 0.7 and 8 actually do have a high impact on the quality of the uh, the eating quality of the the end product. So um, again, this is part of your uh, the processing um, processing chain as well, looking at um, simulation and carcass handling. So read through this uh, once we finish the meeting, and also again, this is these are the points that we spoke about earlier in relation to um, how they impact on your quality as well. So if you just read through the fine print about um, about each of those steps in the processing chain. Now this is a really, um, really good diagram that spells out a basic abattoir flow from um, from start to finish. So it gives you a bit of an idea of what occurs um, 
in the um, in the abattoir. And then now this diagram here it looks a bit busy, but we've got the basic flow of the abattoir in the previous previous slide. Now we're moving on to once you get to um, going through that basic flow, you have various products and um, you have waste, you have processes and you have products. So um, if we look at the, the products or the byproducts, you have things like um, we have dried blood um, hides. The, some of the, I did a bit of research on what hides are used for. Some tattoo artists use hides to practice their art. Um, in, the U, in the US, the uh, leather is used for gridiron balls. Unfortunately, Sharon's aren't made out of um, pig skin. You often hear the comment about um, kicking a pig skin around. You also have um, the cut meat as a product and also you have your meat products such as your grinding meat, curing um, meat that's pickled, smoking, cooking and canning as well. So there is a number of products and byproducts that come out of this, um, out of the um, processing processing plant. Okay, so that's just to give, to give you a bit of an indicator of what occurs during the process. And they have, in Australia, there's fairly strong um, environmental um, protection laws in relation to effluent. So you can see that there are, is a recovery system, there's a secondary system, you have a manure trap, and then you have a final effluent and a, um, you probably have some form of effluent dams that they would treat the effluent in as well, or would there be a process. Here's all your, um, your byproducts, so you can read through that later, I'm not going to, to go through that. And what is um, edible according to uh, various countries? And then once you go through the processing, you actually um, come up with these various cuts that you see in your supermarket, um, butcher, or your um, specialty store. So I'm sure you probably recognise a number of those cuts. There's a tenderloin there. You've got um, a pork rump. There's your um, ribs. And there's a, um, a loin as well. So there's a number of different cuts that I'm sure you'd recognise. And they generally break the um, the animal up into forequarter, middle and leg as well. And then you have your cuts coming off those various sections of the animal. Okay, so next thing we're just going to have a quick chat in relation to um, the wholesale retail sector. So again, this is Rivoli, one of the largest wholesalers in the country. And they're the products they wholesale. In um, Northern Europe, it's quite common to have specialty, um, specialty uh, traditional butchers um, specialising in pork. We can see that's becoming prevalent also in Australia as a form of specialisation and differentiation as well. So you can see that there's the Wiggly Tail Pork Shop and Butchery, and um, there's some other European. Uh, stores on, at the bottom of this slide as well. So it's certainly, you're certainly not, you're seeing alternatives to the traditional pork on the, on the shelf of a supermarket around the country. Okay, so that's a quick overview of the um, pork, pork production, um, pork processing and, and retail, wholesale and retail. I want to just quickly go over um, assessment one with you all at the moment. And um, you all are aware of what's required for assessment one. We after a um, a diagram of an agri-food and fibre value chain of your choice of the product that you've actually chosen. Sorry, and um, there's some dot points of what we actually require. Um, give us some labels so we can understand the um, the diagram that you're doing and the value chain that you're developing. But we also want um, notes. Um, up to a thousand words as dot points directly related to your diagram as well that clarifies the specific features of the diagram. Okay, so um, as per usual, we'd like a bibliography in um, APA style. If you don't understand what APA style is, Google CSU APA referencing. There's a really handy PDF uh, document that will step you through all the different types of um, referencing that you can do depending on the, um, 
the article that you're reading, whether it be a journal, whether it be website, whether it be um, uh, personal conversation, etc. as well. Okay, so referencing... Um, oh, no, I'm sorry, Luke, I didn't. Did you see my question referencing in-house docs such as food safety and QA? That, yeah, definitely you need to reference that. It will be covered in your in that APA document as well. My apologies for not um, seeing that. Oh, okay, all right, no, I did miss that. So, um, yeah, so have a look at that. If you Google CSU APA referencing, you'll be able to cover that in the, um, as part of your reference list. Okay, so um, just one quick note here. It says, um, Nathan has said that a PDF is the most reliable format of submitting graphics via EAST. It does assist us because if you submit a Word document, um, the graphics tend to um, tend to move around a bit. So make sure you PDF it before you actually attach it. Um, Luke, if there's if there's no on public or academic domain, should we attach them? Sorry, if there's noi, if they're not on public or oh, not sorry, my apologies. Um, yes, you'll need to include them in the reference list, not the appendix. And um, <laughs> that's okay. It will um, step you through the process. Um, for um, for actually, if there's no author or, or the likes, it will actually be able to step you through that. Uh, if you have problems, just shoot me through an email, and we can we can step through that. Okay. But I'll go back into the forum and answer your question because it's high likelihood that a number of people probably have the same the same question. If you wanted to shoot email me through the um, the name of the document or where I might be able to have a look at it. Let's see if I can't reference it for you guys and we'll go from there. Okay, so we just need to finish up pretty quickly. What we're going to look at is some simple and much more um, detailed uh, value chains. Oh, in-house with the business. Okay, I understand what you meant now. You can, um, there's, you can actually reference in-house, um, I can't remember what it's called. It's it's called communication or something like that. Or there, there's either personal communication or there are in-house documents on as well. So you should be able to reference that without any trouble. Um, is there any software programs you recommend for use on a Mac? Look, I have a Mac, and if I did this, I would probably just use um, Shapes. In uh, you could probably use PowerPoint. And in PowerPoint, you'll be able to potentially use, uh, let me just open PowerPoint, uh, maybe design, I uh, know not design, shapes or smart art. Have a look at smart art back on your Mac and then you should be able to PDF your document from there. So this is a very simplistic, no worries, uh, pork supply chain. Depending on what you're aiming for in this subject, it is simple. Um, this one is a little bit more detailed and it's talking, it goes from your seed stock through to your growth um, and finish your productions with a few of your inputs. Talks about your slaughtering and your, um, your primary processing, your secondary processing and the outputs at the end. Okay, so um, that is a little bit more detailed. And then this one gets into um, a lot more detail um, as well. So it's a more detailed structure. It splits it out into um, the farmer, the primary process, the secondary process, your marketing, logistics, and your retail. And they've got dot points in here as well. Okay. So what I would suggest is you have a really good look over these and um, have a look at the various steps in the in the chain. Now there's another really good one I want to show you. This one is a really good example of a value chain. Um, when you look at it, don't um, have, uh, just stop and have a really good read of everything. 
Um, colour coding is important because it makes it easy for you to recognise the um, various elements in the value chain. This one also includes the support industries. So there's government industries there, there's animal based um, sort of your, um, your veterin veterinary or your, um, you know, your Pfizer's, your Verbacks of the world, your non-government organisations are involved there as well. Um, banks are involved there as well. So you've got um, the support networks uh, to the value chain as well. I think it could potentially be laid out a little bit better than this, um, but what we're trying to point out is the fact that there's different colour coding which makes it easy and also to consider your support networks as well. That's really important. Um, this one also is just a bit, it's vertical. Um, have a look at that in the sense of it, it goes through your farming, logistics, manufacturing, retail and food services and um, it doesn't necessarily have your um, your support networks either. So when you're doing your research in relation to value chain, that's certainly something that you need to consider are the support networks as well. Okay, so that's the end of the meeting for today. Um, I hope I've answered all your questions and